Every real estate investor has a different property, a different journey, different portfolio even. How we get started is something that we're all willing to share. Today I'm joined with Anson Young who has so much experience in flipping homes and burrs across the entire US that we thought, hey, we really need to pick your brain today and we are gonna learn today on how you got started in real estate. Hey, Anson, thanks for joining and welcome to the show today. Hey, thanks, Noah, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, we're just going to pull back the curtain and jump right in. We want to give you the floor here a little bit and tell us how you got started in real estate. If you could turn back the clock a little bit and tell us how you got started. Long story short is uh, I was in tech a long time ago. 1999, I started in tech, but I got laid off kind of in the dot-com bubble like everybody did in about 2003. And so I wasn't sure what to do next. Uh, I could either double down on tech or not. And I had no idea what that not meant. Right before I moved down to Phoenix for a couple of years, my friend handed me Rich Dad Poor Dad, which is kind of a basic origin story for real estate investors. I don't have a special story on that front, but I read that book and it really resonated like, do I want to go down this path of 30 years in a cubicle like my dad did? He was in tech. Or do I want to do this other thing. And so when I landed in Phoenix, I basically was gung ho on doing real estate. And so I pretty much did everything that I could to get in front of anybody that I could that knew even a little bit more than me to get started. So you obviously had, you know, your dad's work experience to show you that firsthand, this is maybe the path I don't want to pursue. And then you had that little purple Bible that I think a lot of us real real estate investors get. So obviously, Rich Dad Poor Dad gives you the, the roadmap to real estate uh, investing. Why was that what you chose instead of, you know, traditional thing like stocks or, you know, newer things that came out around that time. And even around today, you know, crypto is, is in the conversation. So, so why real estate is what you honed in on? Well, I mean, that book was all about real estate and it made a lot of sense. I kind of realized that I was drawn to real estate. I, you know, anytime we were up in the mountains or, you know, I'd pick up the, the little brochure of all the listings that were in the area and I'd be like, this would be so cool to have a ski cabin or a, you know, beach house or whatever that looked like, you know, after reading the book and it was all just about this tangible asset, like I can go touch it. That makes, you know, that makes a lot of sense to normal people. <laughs> Crypto is a little bit uh, more complicated. Real estate, you know, you can go put your hands on the brick and be like, yeah, this this thing is mine. And I understand it. I could fix it. I can add value to it. I can have special tax benefits from owning it. All of those things made just a lot of sense at the time. Yeah, obviously a, a three prong attack here with, with real estate. You get the principal pay down, you get cash flow potentially. And then like you said, the tax benefits. So, you know, what, what could possibly go wrong? So once you said, okay, real estate is the investment, um, I'm going to pursue the the lever that's going to get me to financial freedom. How'd you pick your strategy and what strategy did you start to pursue then once you said, yeah, real estate's my, my gung-ho here? I have this kind of story where my first year I was just so scattered and just running around with my head cut off that I had no idea what I was doing. And I was trying 10 different strategies all at once. And I really wasn't laser focused at all. You know, for the first year, I was basically learning all about real estate. After that year, I had one of my, you know, one of my friends who became kind of a mentor, you know, she came to me with this deal. She said, I know that this area is up and coming. You know, they're building the new Cardinal Stadium right across the street. It's going to be a good long-term play. I think that this is the deal for you. And what very little I knew, I ran a little bit of numbers, kind of checked it out. And my wife and I decided to do a live-in flip on that deal. So our very first deal, we moved in, fixed up the rest of what needed to be fixed up. For us, it was a year. We lived there for a year and then we decided to sell because we, in our personal lives, we wanted to move back up to Denver and we're pretty much done with Phoenix. And so thankfully that was like right at the end of 2005. So thankfully we sold right around then because the Sun Belt really started to get hit in 2006 with kind of that pre-mortgage crisis. It seemed like two weeks after I sold, the market started cooling down, <laughs> but we were out. We pulled the cord, live in flip success. Let's get back to Denver. So it sounds like you were in the Glendale area if you were near near the Arizona stadium, if that's correct. Yeah, I watched it go up from my house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with that area as well. Uh, I'm not investing, but just spent some time there. So can we talk numbers about that first property? Obviously, you got in and then you got out and then you're in Denver, Colorado now. Obviously, you didn't stop investing in real estate and kept that that train going. So if you could tell us about that purchase price, what you guys did to the property, and then maybe the profit that you took into your Denver portfolio, then um, if you could maybe uh, go into that for us. We bought that property for around 150. It didn't need much, honestly. Like Looking back and all the other deals that we've done, 
time it needed just like paint, touch-ups, some stuff done in the kitchen, probably less than like $7,500 worth of stuff. And then we sold it for about 230000 So our, our net profit was roughly around $60,000 that we moved back to Colorado with some cash in hand. Felt like starting over because I didn't know the Denver market. I knew I wanted to continue doing real estate. And so taking that money and having a little bit of a cushion when you're starting in a new place was pretty ideal. That's a definitely, a, I would say, a home run for your first deal. Really great to take 60K and roll it into your you know next step of your portfolio. And that's what I want to segue into here then. You moved to Denver. You you know had success on your first deal. Did your portfolio change? Did your strategy change? What did you start to look for then in Denver? Did, did it change a lot different than what you were looking for uh, in Phoenix at that time? Yeah, it felt like a whole lot changed. I'm somewhat of a slow learner, apparently, because it took me about another year before I did, did another deal. I was really kind of studying the market, trying to figure out what was going on. I took a job I working for a real estate agent and he was having me do broker price opinions. They're just these kind of $50 appraisals that the banks do for bank owned foreclosures. And so I was doing dozens of those per week and hated it. But I am super grateful for that experience because now I can kind of just comp a property based off of, you know, really rough numbers and just pulling really quick data because I had to do that for, you know, almost a whole year, basically. And then I got my license in 2007 and then I started doing deals again. And at that time, 2007, 2008, the market was falling a whole lot more bank owned foreclosures. You know, the inventory was going crazy. It was going up. It felt like it was just a whole different market than when I was in Phoenix. It was like red hot, you know, properties appreciating like crazy. And now a couple of years later, there's a lot of fear in the market. Stepping in and doing another deal in that kind of environment, it's pretty tough. But I found that going after bank owned foreclosures was something that made a lot of sense. There's not a lot of emotion in those deals. Basically just a spreadsheet. I give out a number. The asset manager says yes or no. Nobody's offended that I have a low ball offer or anything like that. And so <laughs> I like that formula for the most part. And so I just started going heavily after bank owned foreclosures with the idea of flipping them. I'm kind of a transactional guy for a long time up until recently. So I did basically flipping and wholesaling for the next 10, 12 years after that. <laughs> and then you said, uh, obviously pivoting here a little bit um, more recently, we'll talk about that, but obviously you've been super successful in those 10 to 12 years or else you probably wouldn't still be doing it today and moving into different strategies. But could you tell us about some of your mistakes or maybe some of the hiccups that, you know, I'm sure it wasn't day one, you were a great successful wholesaler and flipper. I'm sure there were one to two properties that you're like, oh man, that could have gone a lot better. Are there any of those stories that you're like, oh wow, that that was just terrible and I lost X amount of money off, the, off that deal? Oh yeah. Um, if you're in this business, it's going to happen one way or the other. And so I found that that I get in the most trouble is if I if I venture outside of my buy box, kind of my my business has a buy box of what our property should look like. It should be under this amount, not this much work, certain time frames that we need to stay within. And so anytime I've gone outside of that is when I've gotten in trouble. And that happens when you're hard up for a deal or you need to put money in play or you need to get your contractors back to work. Those mistakes happen when you just kind of stretch on a deal and you wouldn't normally take it, but you're like, well, I have private lenders who are, they really want to put their money into my deal. Otherwise they'll go on to another guy. They won't be able to lend that money for another four or five months. That was kind of a scenario that I was in a couple of years ago where I was kind of in between projects. I needed to put some money into play. I bought a property that had structural issues, which I don't ever deal with. I had some good bids in hand. The market was going crazy. I figured, you know, stretching outside of my box this time should be okay. And immediately got punched right back into that box, you know, six months later when, you know, I'm writing a check for $30,000 at the closing table. I'm supposed to be getting money at the closing table. I'm not supposed to be writing money at the closing table. And, you know, the things that went wrong were this, you know, the structural fix didn't work. It was about halfway the amount that they could kind of fix it. And then you kind of have a stigma of a structural property. You have to disclose certain things if there's structural damage to a property or structural repairs. And so that just increased my holding time, plus a small flood in the basement, which wasn't part of this thing. So a couple of things kind of lined up. My thin kind of margins disappeared and then went all the way into the red. Six months later, I am writing a check. And so it really teaches you to kind of stay in your lane. Don't stretch for those things, even though you think the market's red hot. Everybody's selling their property in 30 days. You know, mine took six months to sell. And so uh, 
that hurts when those holding costs add up, plus spending more money than you thought you would on certain other things. So that's kind of my uh, main story on losing money. Well, it's obviously terrible that you lose money, but it's great to you know hear your full circle moment here and say, you know, I went out of my buy box. I recognize where I went wrong, not pointing the finger on, you know, it could have been coding if or, you know, permit that slowed down the process. But I admit I went outside of my box that was comfort for me. And this is why it went wrong. It's definitely a valuable, valuable tip for a lot of our newer investors as well that will be looking for that one strategy. So obviously you said here, well, hinted at here that you're kind of pivoting your strategy a little bit. Can you talk about what Anson's doing here in 2024? Maybe what you just did in 2023 that's been a little bit different from your past 10 to 15 years in real estate? I finally, again, I'm a slow learner, apparently. I finally took the advice of smarter people than me and kind of stepping out of the transactional game more into long-term cash flow. And so for me... It was about 2020 when I started this plan in, in, in effect. And then the, the pandemic happened and nobody knew it was going to go on. So I probably delayed that an extra year. But I've been successful with marketing, finding off market deals, doing deals out of state. We've done this for uh, for years now. And so it just made sense to go into a couple markets out of state where there is a lot more cash flow to be had, lower purchase prices, more opportunities for different rental strategies, like less short-term rental restrictions, mid-term rental restrictions, all those things. And so we chose a couple markets out of state, went heavily into uh, marketing and acquisition. And you know, at first we're wholesaling properties, then we're flipping properties. And then as uh, the wise Tarl Yarber says, a burr is a flip that you keep. And so after you have all of those steps in place where you can purchase a property, fix it, now you can institute a kind of a burr process. And so we've been doing burr purchases for the last couple of years. So now really seeing the benefits of, uh, of the tax bill at the end of the year, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Well, it sounds like you've got a lot of different you know strategies that you've either grown out of or still possibly still have flipping or you want to hold them longer now with the burst strategy. What would you recommend to somebody that's, you know, this is my first time thinking about real estate. I have no idea where to go. Obviously, Rich Dad Poor Dad is a great uh, resource that I've had. I've read that. Where would I go after reading Rich Dad Poor Dad in your opinion, Anson? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the next steps are going to depend on your goals, your budget, your time, <laughs> a lot of those things. I would continuing in the learning process for the first you know, six months at least to where you can read up on different strategies, you know, how to invest in real estate. The book from Bigger Pockets has a bunch of different strategies in it. Go through that, pick a couple that really appeal to you that kind of mesh with your budget, your time, your goals, and then dive deeper into each one of those strategies. So if you're interested in flipping, you know, there's tons of education out there, videos, books that you can read and get familiar with so that you're ready to pull the trigger and be a, a lot more informed. If you want to go down the rental path, that's obviously a little bit different path, but a lot of the fundamentals are the same. I would say do your upfront work of educating yourself on what it looks like to, you know, to buy these properties, what you need in place, if you need to save up a down payment, or if you need a decent credit score. You can start working on those things while you're learning. And then a couple months later, you're ready to pull the trigger on something, whatever that strategy is. But that first step, I think if you're put in that time, you're never going to regret unless you put in like 10 years of, of study and you never take action. <laughs> so a reasonable amount of study so that you're ready to take on, you know, take on the real estate world. That's really great advice. And obviously it's, it's great to hear somebody who says they're a, a slow learner, but to see that you're at, at the stage you are in your career, I think we would all love to slowly learn to get to the point that you are today. If somebody's looking to learn more about you, Anson, I know where to find you, but where can our audience go and find a little bit more about you and some of the things that you and your team are doing here for 2024? So if you're on bigger pockets, uh, I have a profile there, please hit me up. I'd love to talk to you and help you out in any way that I can. Also uh, on YouTube or Instagram. So at Anson Young or at Young Anson on Instagram. Well, it'll be almost impossible to not find you. You're obviously making a lot of noise in our community and are doing a lot of great things up in Denver for a lot of clients as well. So really excited to have you on the show. i um, really excited to hear your story and uh, really excited to pick your brain today. Thanks so much. This is awesome. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and follow Bigger Pockets on YouTube. And if you want to follow me, you can go over to the Bigger Pockets forums or on Instagram at Making Bacon REI. Really look forward to having you on How Did You Get Started in Real Estate on the Bigger Pockets Rookie Channel here on YouTube. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day.